Okay, uh, today we're going to be talking about functions and continuity. Uh, so the first thing, uh, in the first lecture, right, we introduced sort of a formal definition of what a function is, right? Um, being a subset of the Cartesian product of the sets for which um, the function acts on in between. Um, but we didn't really talk about any properties of it, so the first thing we have to do is talk about some general properties of functions. Um, and so this first part will have not really anything to do with topology, um, just general function theory. Um, so we're going to say f is a function from x to y, a is going to be a subset of x, and b is going to be a subset of y. Um, the image of f um, or I guess I should say the image of a um, f of a uh, so a, remember, this is a set, so we're applying our function to a set, um, but this is not in the usual sense, right? So this is just notation, really. Um, and so the image of a is going to be a set consisting of y in our space y, such that Uh, y equals f of x for some x in a, right? So essentially, this is the set you get when you apply f of x to all of the elements in a, and then you might have uh, some repeat values, in which case um, you would sort of disregard those. Because uh, in sets, you can't have um, repeat elements. Um, conversely, there is the inverse image of B. And that is F, denoted F inverse of B, right? And notice that, again, this is just notation and that this inverse image will always exist even if f as a function doesn't have a well-defined inverse function. This, by definition, is just x in x such that f of x is contained in b. Um, now, one of the things to notice here is that the definition for f inverse of b is logically a lot simpler than the definition of f of a. And as a result, f inverse of b is going to have a lot nicer properties than f of a, and the proofs are going to sort of reflect that, right? When you're dealing with proofs that involve f of a and f inverse of b, um, dealing with f inverse of b is a lot simpler because if I say x is an element of f inverse of b in my proof, then this just allows me to say that f of x is in b. Whereas if I have an element of f of a in my proof, then I don't have a unique x which I can say y equals f of x, right? There could be more than one x, and so I have to say there exists some x such that y equals f of x. Um, so, you, so it's a lot, um, it's a lot harder to deal with, um, and that's going to be reflected in the properties that we're going to talk about. Um, so, 
in the text, uh, Sweston, there's after these definitions, there's basically just a bunch of properties. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll mark down the important ones. Um, so if you have two subsets, right? So say A1 is a subset of A2, which is a subset of X, then we can apply the images and we get the same set inclusion in Y, right? Uh, similarly, we can do the same thing with inverse images. So F inverse of B1, subset of F inverse of B2, subset of X. And again, to prove this, again, to prove a subset, um, claim you just have to let you have to start with some general element in the first set break that down into to what it means to be in that set use the given information and then show that that element that you started with is on the second set um, the next property is that if f of a is a subset of b then um, then A is a subset of F inverse of B. So in a sense, um, at least by set inclusion, you can sort of take inverse images on both sides, although that's not exactly what you're doing. Um, uh, but uh, the first thing you can do to prove this um, is by showing that A is a subset of F inverse of F of A. Um, and that actually does prove this statement, right? Because uh, if, if F of A is a subset of B, then I can apply F inverse on both sides. I would get F inverse of F of A is a subset of f inverse of b, but then a is a subset of this, so a is a subset of f inverse of b. Uh, so if you prove this uh, simpler statement, which just deals with a, then you can prove this statement. Um, and also the proof of this is actually really easy. If x is an a, then f of x is in f of a, right? Because um, uh, how do I say this? Um, because f of x is an element such that it equals f of x for some x and a, right? <laughs> um, and so this shows that, um, in fact, x is an element of f inverse of f of a. Um, now, notice we don't always have a set uh, equality here. Um, and in fact, we would only have this equality uh, when f is injective. Which means that if f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 equals x2. Um, so injectivity basically means that you don't have any repeat values of f, right? If you have two values of f that are the same, then you have to have the same input value. Um, so for example, in uh, graphing terms, right, f of x equals x is injective because there's no repeat lines, uh, but something like x squared is not injective because you have repeat values. Um, similarly, we have f of f inverse of b is contained in b. Um, and so, again, the proof is rather simple. And this is an equality uh, when f is surjective. 
at least um, surjective amongst into B. or I should say onto is the proper mathematical word. And surjective just means that um, any B can be written as F of X for some X in the domain. Um, now, uh, the next property is that the inverse image respects complements uh, this is equal to, so F inverse of the complement of B is equal to the complement of F inverse of B. Um, the next few properties deal with images and inverse images of unions and co uh, intersections. Um, so we have F of A1 union A2 is equal to F of A1 union F of A2. Um, for intersections, uh, I think my power just went out. <laughs> Um, for intersections, F of A1 intersect A2 is a subset of F of A1. Sorry, my computer is starting to lag because I'm not in battery any, or I'm not plugged in anymore. Um, is a subset of F of A1 intersect F of A2. Uh, sorry, am, am I still here? Like, am I still getting connection? So what's... Yes, you are there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, right, so notice we don't have a set equality here. Um, and so it's important to show, um, at least try to prove that, um, that this, the intersection of two images is contained in the image of an intersection. Try to prove it and see where it goes wrong. Um, that's an important exercise. Um, and we also have uh, similar results for the inverse image. However, uh, unlike with the image where we have only an inclusion here, um, we also have equality for both cases. So this is one of those examples where um, the inverse image has a bit more power than the normal image. And both of these formulas um, generalize to arbitrary families of sets. Sorry, arbitrary families of sets. So what does that mean? I mean that f of a union of a family is going to be the union of f of each uh, set contained in that family. Um, f of the intersection of the family is going to be contained in the intersection of f of that family. And same for the uh, inverse images, you're going to have, um, you're still going to have equality uh, for arbitrary families. Uh, and so that concludes the general set theory, or not set theory, uh, function theory. Um, now we get to talk about continuous functions. So now we bring in the topological aspect. Um, 
So if x has the topology t and y has topology s, then f, f, the function f from x to y is continuous if um, for every open set in Y, so every V in S, uh, the inverse image is open in X. So it's an element of the uh, topology T. Um, and that's all there is to it, to the definition. And this continuity is um, one of the most important aspects of topology. Um, as we go on, we will see that um, when we define sort of properties on our topological spaces, we'll see that if we have a continuous function from x to y, and x satisfies some topological property, then so will y. Uh, so continuous functions sort of preserve the important topological properties um, that we will see. Um, this notion of continuity also gives us a notion of when two topological spaces are considered the same, um, and this is when f from x to y is a homeomorphism if f is a bijection. So a bijection is a function which is injective and surjective, um, uh, which essentially just means that the sets x and y, so ignoring the topology, the sets x and y can be considered uh, the same, right? f creates a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements in x and elements in y. Um, so it's injective and surjective. Uh, but of course that's not it. Um, f itself has to be continuous. And since f is a bijection, f inverse is a well-defined function from y to x. And for this f to be a homeomorphism, f inverse has to be continuous. Um, in this case, x and y are called homeomorphic. Homeomorphic. Uh, and notice that here also f inverse is also a homeomorphism, um, which uh, isn't very special, but it is true. Um, now we're going to give some equivalent properties for continuous functions. So if f x to y, the following are equivalent. Um, the first is that f is continuous, right? Uh, just by this definition up here. Um, 
So inverse images of open sets are open. The second is sort of a uh, what we would call a local, um, how should I say, a local characterization of openness. Okay, my power's back on. Um, P, uh, so if, if P is a point in the set X and V is a neighborhood. Also, I'm going to s start using this different language here. Oh, my power just went off again. <laughs> um, yeah. Here, neighborhood is going to mean uh, an open set of a certain point. Um, so this, this, um, and I'm often going to abbreviate this as NBHD, uh, just to be concise when writing. Um, it just saves time. So if V is a neighborhood of F of P, then, uh, F inverse of V is a neighborhood of P. Uh, so this condition is equivalent to F being continuous. Um, and again, this is a local characterization of continuity because you're looking at each point of X um, and all neighborhoods of F of P. Uh, the third equivalent statement is very similar to this first one, or this second one, I should say. If P is in X and V is a neighborhood of F of P, then there is a neighborhood um, I'll call it U of P such that F of U is contained in V. Uh, the fourth condition is that for all subsets A of X, uh, F, the image of the closure of A, is contained in the closure of the image of A. Um, which is a seemingly simple characterization, although it's not that often used, um, at least in my experience. The fifth uh, condition is that for all B and Y, and this is sort of a, a dual to this, the closure of the inverse image is contained in the inverse image of the closure. And the last equivalence is that for all closed uh, for all closed sets B and Y, F inverse of B is closed in X, right? Um, which is essentially, right, we can see this is really um, more naturally equivalent to F, right? Because, uh, to, or to F being continuous, just remember F is continuous if inverse images of open sets are open, and this is saying that inverse images of closed sets are closed. Uh, so it's just a dual 
um, which makes sense because open and closed sets are very naturally um, inclined, uh, inter interrelated. And so, by the way, to prove this, again, just like with most things where it's like the following are equivalent, you would do it by doing 1 implies 2, 2 implies 3, 3 implies 4, 4 implies 5, 5 implies 6, and 6 implies 1. Um, so you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six separate proofs, uh, and that would show that all six statements are equivalent. Um, and as a final remark for this uh, lecture, uh, we're just going to give some simple examples of continuous functions. Um, so one is that if x, or if f is a function from x to y, and c is some fixed value in y, then f of x equals c is continuous. Um, and so the reason for this is that um, if, again, let's say that the topology on x is t and the topology on y is s. So let v be an open set in y, so v is an s. Um, if c is in v, then f inverse of v is x. Because... Um, for any element x, f of x is going to equal c, which is in v, right? Um, and this is x is open, right? Um, the other possibility, right, c is either in v or it's not in v, right? So the other possibility is that c is not in v, then f inverse of v is equal to the empty set um, because there is no possible way for f of x to be contained in v because f of x is always equal to c uh, and this is open so in either case the inverse image of an open set is open so this is a continuous function um, and another simple example is a function from x to x with f of x equal to x. Um, and because if v is in t, f inverse of v equals v, which is in t, right? Um, so so this shows that inverse images of open sets are open. And so that concludes this lecture. Uh, do you have any questions? No, I'm clear. All right, um, then that's it.